Hi everybody, we're back today again with another edition of Wine 3 Online. Today we're talking about titratable acidity. So let's, uh, let's do a little review. Remember there were two measures of acid in wine. One was pH and one was TA. So why do we have to use both of those? Well, tartaric acid shown here on the left, like any acid, will donate at least one proton. In the case of tartaric acid, it actually donates two protons. The one at the top, that one there, and the one down here on this other oxygen at the bottom. Both of those are acidic and both of those can be donated. Turns out that one is more loose than the other, kind of like a very ripe grape on a cluster. That very ripe grape will fall off easily. Less ripe grapes don't come off as easily. And you can think about it that in this case, if you lose one very ripe proton that comes off the cluster, you'll end up with a molecule that looks like this. Okay, so just that one, that one proton right there is gone. It's come off over here and it's left behind a negative charge. So the positively charged proton leaves. That leaves a negative charge behind because we started out with neutral, a neutral charge. So what happens next? Well, if tartaric acid happens to lose one more proton, then we end up with that same structure at the top But at the bottom, we have another negatively charged oxygen because we've lost another proton. All right, so once again, one proton comes off, that second one's come off, and it leaves behind the negative charge. So the first proton that comes off is that very ripe grape that comes off more easily. The second proton that comes off comes off less easily but it still comes off. Okay, so given that those protons come off in sequence, one after another, it ends up that if we have tartaric acid, and the same actually goes for malic acid, if we have tartaric acid in wine, it's gonna be existent in the wine in three different forms, or we call them species. Three species of tartaric acid. So one of the species is tartaric acid. That's the one that has the, both of those acidic protons still attached. The second species is bitartrate. That's got one proton still attached. And look, this other one, that one's gone. In the case of tartrate, it's lost both acidic protons, one there and one there. So we show bitartrate, and I show that one proton lost down below. Tartrate has lost both acidic protons, and I show both of those below. So what happens if we measure pH? Well, pH, as we, as we talked about in class, measures just the protons that have already been released into solution. So pH would measure those three. But it's not a complete measure of all the acid in your solution, because what are we missing if we just me miss the, m measure those three? We're missing this acidic proton, and this acidic proton, and this acidic proton. So we have more acid than that, than that which is measured by pH only. A stronger acid will release more protons in solution. And in this case, we have sort of a medium strong acid. But no matter how many protons are released in solution, if you have protons left behind, pH is not going to measure them. So we have pH and titratable acidity as two ways of measuring acids in wine. And how, how, does, titrat how, does, how does titratable acidity actually work? Well, we're going to add sodium hydroxide to the wine, and that's going to pull off all the acidic protons from 
tartaric acid or malic acid or the other acids in wine. And how does sodium hydroxide work? Well, when you throw sodium hydroxide in water, it's a salt, just sort of like sodium chloride. Remember sodium chloride? That's just table salt. You put sodium chloride in water, add some water, and it will dissolve into its two ions, sodium and chloride. One's positively charged, one's negatively charged. Together, they make an ionic compound or a salt. Sodium hydroxide is similar. When you put that in water, it's going to dissolve into sodium and a bunch of hydroxide ions. Well, it turns out hydroxide ions love to react with protons. And what do they form? They form water. So if we put hydroxide into wine that's very acidic, this reaction right here is going to happen. And the hydroxide, this guy, right, that's hydroxide, that will neutralize protons. The more hydroxide you add, the more protons you neutralize and you turn them into water. So as we add those hydroxide ions, why does the pH increase? Remember we said we would pH, we would titrate to an endpoint of 8.2. So say we start out and we have a wine, we put a sample of wine in some water like we did when we started the titratable acidity assay and so we'd have a whole bunch of protons right floating around in our solution those protons come from the acid in the wine right so we start out with a whole bunch of protons and say if we measured our pH at the start our pH would say be say it's 3.6 or something like that and then we slowly drip in our sodium hydroxide. So let's let's say we're going to add one mol one atom of sodium hydroxide and that reacts with the one proton to make water. Well now that proton is effectively gone, right? It's neutralized. Let's do this. Let's just erase that proton. We'll erase that proton and the hydroxide ion because well we could leave the water, right? Because water's there. But we removed a proton, right? So now, what happens? Well, our pH has to go up. So I don't know how much it would go up after we add our first drop, say, of sodium hydroxide, but say it goes to 3.7. Well, then let's add another drop of hydrogen, of, 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 of sodium hydroxide. And that one drop won't add just one molecule, but Let's pretend for, for illustration purposes, it adds one molecule and neutralizes one proton, makes another molecule of water. So what are we going to have to do? Well, let's erase these two because they, they were neutralized and for, they formed water. So we'll leave the water behind. But then just like last time, we've got to increase the pH now because our proton concentration has gotten lower. So you see where this is going, right? You add a bunch more hydroxide ions, make a bunch more water, add a bunch more hydroxide ions, make a bunch more water, and you erase, neutralize, get rid of a bunch of protons, right? So as you do that, our pH is going to continue to go up. Say we're up to about 5 now. We're still not to our 8.2 endpoint, so Look at our phenolphthalein in the, in the beaker. It's still clear. Remember, it's going to change when we get to a pH of 8.2, right? So, nope, sorry, my computer's acting up here. Um, so, um, we're back. Um, so, we'll continue to neutralize protons and eliminate them by addition of sodium hydroxide. And as we do, once our pH gets up to 8.2, 
then what happens? Voila, our phenolphthalein changes color because we our indicator, our phenolphthalein changes color when our pH gets to 8.2. So that's exactly what's happened as we've gone along. And what has the sodium hydroxide done? Well, it's pulled off, it's, it's neutralized those three protons that were already removed from the different species of tartaric acid, right? The three protons that would be measured by pH. But because sodium hydroxide is a very strong base, it also pulls off these guys, these protons that were still attached to certain species of tartaric acid. Remember we use the analogy to a large dry sponge. Sodium hydroxide is such a large dry sponge, it can soak up all the pro acidic protons, whether they've already been removed from tartaric acid or whether they're still attached. It's such a strong um, base. So that's how it works. Hopefully that gives you some insight into how the uh, tartaric, uh, the titratable acidity assay works. Please let me know if you have questions. Thanks very much for watching.